Welcome back, everyone. Hope you got your coffee, tea, water, and are ready for our next session, which will be led by Jim Beretta from the Canadian Food Innovation Network. He will be speaking about how robotics is changing food. Today's presentation tells the story of how operations teams can integrate technology into their plants to achieve efficiency and open up new business opportunities for their organizations. Jim will talk about how research, automation, and data are driving the food industry 4.0 to ignite your innovative spirit to be prepared to fulfill the needs of your food service and grocery customers. Jim is president at Customer Attraction. He has been an application engineer and in automation sales and corporate marketing for a large system integrator for most of his 16 years in the automotive in, uh, automation industry. The last 12 years, he has been an independent marketing strategist focused on the automation, robotics, and advanced manufacturing industry. For the Canadian Food Innovation Network, Jim is a member and partner, creating content and representing CFIN at various events. After Jim has finished his presentation, we will open the virtual floor for questions. As a reminder, if you have any questions during or after the presentation, please post them in the Zoom questions box below. Over to you, Jim. Thank you, Mario, uh, and uh, thanks for that kind introduction. And uh, Mariella and Paul, uh, that, those were great presentations as well, so I hope I can measure up. Um, uh, as uh, Mario mentioned, uh, I come from the automation industry, having spent most of my time with ATS Automation in Cambridge. Um, and for the last dozen years, I'm independent, uh, but uh, today I'm representing CFIN, the Canadian Food Innovation Network. And I've been very lucky to have created a lot of content along the way. I've created uh, over 120 webinars, 75 podcasts on such topics as innovation, automation, motion control, uh, robotics, AI, and uh, machine learning. And so uh, I'd like to maybe go to the next slide and, and introduce who CFIN is. So CFIN is a new not-for-profit organization with people strategically located all across Canada. CFIN is launching a series of programs and services to strengthen Canada's food industry by making it easier for Canadian innovators and enterprises to uh, discover trends, insights, innovation, best practices, and profitable connections. They are helping to innovate collabor collaboratively with support of innovation directors, senior mentors, technical resources, working groups, and funding. And they want to grow like-minded business-to-business customers, suppliers, technology companies, researchers, and investors. So CFIN is Canada's gateway for food innovation. CFIN was created to connect, uncover, foster, and facilitate people and companies in the food industry in Canada. And the project that I helped to create was called Robotics in Automation, Seeing is Believing. And I'm going to be showing you some of the video segments that we shot in Toronto, in southwestern Ontario, and in London that will give you a vision into what's happening in automation. We'll, we're going to take you to a mushroom farm, uh, to a university campus, and to companies using vision, AI, 3D printing, and Industry 4.0 to open new markets, to create new delivery technologies, and to get their products to market quickly. So there's a lot of reasons for food manufacturers to consider automation. And there's a lot of reasons that it's really the only path forward. Track and trace, machine vision, scrap control, worker and customer health and worker safety. But I think it really comes down to quality. I also believe that labor attraction and retention is a key strategy of why factory owners should be adding automation. It's difficult enough to attract anyone to work in a manufacturing today, but if you know that you have an industrial robot or a collaborative robot to help make your job easier, as a worker, you'll likely go to the factory that is more modern, has automation and robotics, versus a factory where essentially you are the robot. And the last point to make automation in food and food factories and food distribution is around the simple fact that everyone is having challenges hiring people right now. Canada's unemployment rate has fallen to a new all-time low again. Stats Canada reports that it fell 5.2% in April, down from a previous record of 5.3% that was set in March, and 8% last year. This is lower than the long-term average of 8.16%. Before we get into the meat of the presentation, I wanted to talk a little bit about the relationship between the automation sector and the food industry. With some exceptions, food, robotics, and automation 
have had a little bit of a difficult relationship, kind of a rocky start. Robots have been around since the 1960s, but have not always been easy for the food industry to adopt. Margins have always been very thin in food, and the robot companies were not really all that interested in making solutions for razor thin margin industries. The food industry too relied heavily on people to assemble, to dispense, to pick, to place, to ship. And it was just easy to call manpower and send in more people. And maybe I'm showing my age by mentioning the word manpower. Um, another challenge is that robot companies and automation companies liked automotive and medical device and everything in between. But a lot has happened of late. Robots have become easier to use. The industry has become more competitive. Robots are flexible, have decreased in price, and increased in performance. And robots became easy to work beside, and automation integrators started to specialize in niche markets with stainless steel, food-grade food conveyance, and food-friendly accessories, sensors, software, and things like integrated washdown environments, which you'll see as, I, as we go through some of the um, uh, presentation materials today. So what's exciting about exploring food and automation? Well, lots of things. Maintenance, uptime, upgrades, and new opportunities as, as we see more automation being used in more places and a growing acceptance of automation, robotics, vision, and advanced sensing by the food industry. What's really exciting is that most of these pieces of automation that I'm gonna be showing you today are industry 4.0 ready. If they're low on broccoli or if there's a part jam, they just report it to the owner the maintenance person, the company that stocks the food, and the problem gets rectified. Industry 4.0 is so much easier to deal with when, you, of course, we have new machinery. And the first video clip that I'd like to show you is fairly local. We're going to Putnam, Ontario, which is just west of Ingersoll. So Tara, let's roll that. Mushroom farms are facing an increasing demand for their products worldwide for health reasons and as a meat alternative. But at the same time, mushroom farming is experiencing a labor shortage. Mushrooms require consistent and reliable lab labor as they are grown indoors year round and they double in size every single day. There's an estimated 20% labor gap and 40% annual turnover rate on Canadian mushroom farms and training a new harvester can take up to six months. Mushrooms are challenging to pick. You cannot touch the tops while picking them. And picking mushrooms too in a high humidity environment is backbreaking work and people just don't do it for long. They just can't. My Cyanix company provides an affordable and defendable harvesting solution for mushroom farmers. Additionally, their system increases product quality and consistency, reduces food safety risks and collects and analyzes data for yield improvement. My Cyanix partnered with Western University to develop an automated robot harvesting system, an innovative first in the world. I want to call it a robot, but it's more complicated than that. Mycionics had to develop software, hardware, and firmware to develop the components that they needed to scan, to pick, and pack mushrooms for harvesting. In Canada, we're actually uh, leading this automated robot world in this $53 billion market. So Industry 4.0 is alive at Mycionics. The data collection provides valuable insight into the farms, existing growing and harvesting metrics, leading to better agronomic commercial and operational solutions at the farm. So think AI, machine learning, and think of all the farms that are gonna be connected, optimized for growing more and better mushrooms. And I wanna thank the president, Michael Curry, the farm owner and mushroom grower, Murray Good, and the tech team led by Stephen Gilbedek for their bold leadership in this market. And I did stop off at the company farm and I bought a bunch of mushrooms on the way home. And what you're seeing right now on, on, on this, a piece of video is the actual mushroom picker. So the red line we saw right now is creating a 3D point cloud so it can give the mushroom picker instructions on where to pick. This next slide talks about ghost kitchens. In the robotics, in the robots in action, seeing is believing project, we talk about ghost kitchens. And if you've never heard of a ghost kitchen, it's a kitchen without waiters, there are no tables and there's limited parking. A revolutionary, a relatively new innovation in Canada made popular by Uber and fast forwarded by the pandemic. Ghost kitchens do tie into the theme of robotics and automation. And this particular ghost kitchen sells 20 different brands of food. So it's interesting from the consumer side, 
but also the brand owners can be part of a growing network of restaurants without big investment and risk. This particular ghost kitchen is the busiest one in Canada, located in London, just near the Western campus. And we take a visit to Western to talk about food, automation and servicing students and staff and others like me, where I visited in off hours and then came back with a video crew. And ghost kitchens, inventory is an issue. And when you have multiple SKUs uh, and you have multiple concepts in one place, understanding how they control inventory and ordering will lead to insights that will impact their business demand planning. So next up, we'll go to uh, Western where we're gonna meet Brady Parr, who's in the food operations in UCC. First up, we're gonna take you to Western University where to increase convenience, reduce costs, provide food service for students and staff during off hours, Automation is changing the game. Let's take a look. Brady, thanks for joining us for this conversation. Thanks for having me. Brady, um, how did Western get started with automated food kiosks? Really, we're just looking for uh, an opportunity to provide um, food services for our students outside of the regular operational hours of our current operations that we have here at the uh, UCC. We originally started with um, just the Theos coffee, mm -hmm. and then we went to the salad machine, which we came in about a year ago, and then we introduced the pizza machine just in January. Brady, can you uh, give us a demo of what we're going to sure see thing. here? Absolutely. So, as this, when the students walk up, they would they would uh, simply just touch here to start. They get their choices of uh, seven different pizzas. Um, I'm going to, for just for sake of just choosing one, I'm going to choose a regular pepperoni today. You get your choice of either cold pizza to take home and cook on your own, or you can choose a hot pizza. Right now, actually, we're providing a 50% discount, so it is half off the regular price. And then the, the student would just hit this to, to add that to their order, confirm that this is what they would like to order, and then simply provide your, your form of payment. Today, I'm going to be using a coupon code. So I'm going to hit coupon, and the order has been confirmed. Your pizza is on its way, and then you can provide you get the receipt emailed to you, or it'll actually... Um, spit out of this area right here. So I'm going to hit yes, and now we wait. Nice. And so how long does this take? So each pizza takes approximately about three minutes, and then you can actually watch the pizza being cooked around the corner on the front of the machine as well. What are some of the challenges that you found with automated food dispensing? Um, some, some challenges could be, you know, spur of the moment problems the machine might have. Um, payment processing, which really hasn't been that much of a challenge besides just the integration with our meal plan on campus. How, how is the engagement going with students? It's good. We look, we're doing a full rollout of the uh, program with proper uh, engagement and promotions in September of next year, because we've still been kind of launching it softly over the course of the past, like say five to six months. Um, but the engagement has been, has been really positive and the students are accepting it and, and they're curious. Well, that's great. Yeah. It sounds very exciting. It's very it interesting. Is. And uh, thank you very much My for pleasure. Uh, joining me. Thank you. So I'm, a, I'm agreeing with Brady. I see this segment growing choices and, and more and more robots. Um, for our next segment, we're going to show you some video footage of food automation from the Seeing is Believing uh, uh, episode. And one of the things I don't think we talk about in automation of food is that people have their place. Uh, people are good at thinking, they're planning, problem solving. People are not so good at pick and place, the rote and routine jobs and people when removed from food makes food cleaner and I think cleaner is better. Uh, so Tara could please uh, roll the next slide. And, and I wanna thank Tom Kurowski, applications team lead from uh, JMP Solutions for this file footage. JMP Automation Robotics Division has a specialty in building high speed, high volume automated food handling and packaging solutions. They've been focusing on the flexibility of robots for food for over a dozen years. Food safety compliance and sanitary design are the key elements of automation solutions that they deliver. One of Tom's comments that uh, we had uh, really hit home. He said a big part of automation, especially this kind of complex process automation is educating customers. There's lots of unique challenges, uh, the human element, 
uh, setting expectations, especially for new users of automation and coaching clients. Protein's at the top of the automation pyramid when it comes to food. So think chicken, beef, pork, fish, and they are directly handling the product. RTE is another sector that JMP operates and ready to eat is uh, sim similar in sanitary design, but it's actually a bit more stringent because the food tends to be not cooked the same way that you cook a chicken breast. Uh, computer vision is important. Almost every single line has computer vision and robots, as you can see, the white ones, they're being designed more and more for uh, sanitary compliance. And you'll see in the video, you'll see what robots washing down robots, right? So this is a very clever idea. And I believe that uh, JMP has a patent on this. So they designed the process so it looks easy. Um, the, you saw the high-speed sandwich line, which takes tops off of buns, adds protein, adds toppings, and puts the bun back into and puts the bun back onto the uh, the sandwich. And each plate must be filled, or else you get waste. For um, I really like watching these ro robots run, it's, especially when they're in high speed. And you might note that uh, that that the white robots and especially end effectors are all built for food. And you'll see sometimes the blue conveyors mean. Um, uh, clean, cleanliness as well. Um, so next we're going to, to go to a short factory tour of Armo Tool where we'll see packaging, smart vision sorting based on uh, cloud robots that can work beside people without harming them. So go, let's go ahead and run that. We had a chance to visit an automation systems integrator, Armo, not too long ago. Armo is a leading builder of special machines and automated solutions in Southwestern Ontario where food, beverage and cannabis industries are being introduced to robots, conveyors and custom solutions. So let's make our way to another Canadian company who is literally changing the game. Here in London, Ontario, at Armo, and I'm talking to Ben Whitney. Ben, thank you very much for allowing us to come in and chat with you today. Thanks, Jim. My pleasure. Uh, you're a vertically integrated automation house. What does that mean? So, what that means is a lot of the subcomponents that go into the work that we do, we build those in house, and that's a real advantage, particularly during today's supply chain disruptions, so that we can control the delivery and the quality of the subcomponents that go into the automated solutions that we design and build. With a modern robotic solution, some of the flexibility that used to be challenging where a box size is changing or a product size is changing or a product is organic in nature and a little bit varying in its size, those problems can be overcome now that used to be quite difficult. And you're seeing from your um, food and beverage customers, you're seeing that, right? You're seeing the Costco's or the uh, uh, some of the big food producers that are demanding these these different box sizes and such. Yeah, different pack sizes. And sometimes the box that we would have thought of as a back room box that gets torn apart for the boxes that go on the shelf. Sometimes that box is now the box that the customer is seeing and, and purchasing. How important is the automation being easy for food and bev industry? Yeah, it, it is super important. One, um, they don't necessarily have like a, a very um, high control team that can support like all of this programming and, and, and so on. Um, and at the same time, the end user, there's su unfortunately such a big turnaround on staff um, that you need something that it's like plug and play, mm -hmm. sort of like your phone kind of mentality, just, just go and use it. And collaborative robots mean that you can work comfortably beside automation, is that correct? That's right. A collaborative robot doesn't require guarding in between it and a human. So you can work in much closer proximity, which often works well in food and beverage plants where the floor plan is quite tight. And it's also a great way to get your operators comfortable with robots that they're safe and they can work close to them. And so the machine that's behind us, it fits into an existing assembly line where uh, a skid of boxes comes. And then right now humans are preparing those boxes to go into an existing machine that's packing those boxes. So this machine takes out that very boring job it runs, you know, 24-7 if it needs to at a relatively slow speed, but fast enough to serve the machine that's behind it. Tell us a little bit about the collaborative robot and the controls. This is something that you've had experience with now? No, so this is one of my first projects, which makes uh, collaborative really the way to go with the robot integration. You know, it's super easy to integrate with the robot. The whole flow control programming makes everything 
really seamless for something with someone not a lot of experience. That's kind of where new industries are very beneficial in trying to get a collaborative robot in because it gives you that kind of feeling of, you know, here's a robot, you know, kind of work around with the robot. This is kind of how everything kind of works together. There's a lot more safeguards in place with a collaborative robot as well because everything is a lot more touchy on, you know, torque limits and safety limits as well as that. So it makes everything integrating a lot easier for a beginner person. This machine... Uh, needs to go in and be running over a weekend because they can't shut down their line. And it also needs the flexibility to be able to revert to manual should something go wrong where the boxes aren't uh, behaving the way they're expected to. We want to go back to manual for a shift or two. As we were coming through your facility, um, we saw some autonomous robots. Yes. And can you tell us a little bit about how that may affect food and beverage too? Yeah, we're seeing a lot of interest from food and beverage customers for autonomous mobile robots. So it's like a robotic cart. It doesn't require a fixed path, so it can interact uh, in a live space with forklifts and humans. And even with you know a cart that was left in the way, it can it can navigate around that. But we're really seeing them both in roles where you would have maybe used a forklift to move a heavy load, but also in roles where we're just supplying a little bit of product um, to sort of a Kanban station or. Uh, you know, smaller totes of, of delivering like popsicle sticks rather than um, a finished product. And on our tour as well, you showed me uh, two Scara robots with two flex feeders. So can you tell us what, the, what that's about? Sure. Um, often people are getting a product in bulk and then they want to get it into singles. And maybe that product also needs some quality checks. So with that feeder, you can pour a whole bunch of something out onto a, a shaker it shakes them so that it singulates the parts. And then we're using a camera to find them and a robot to pick and place them into whatever orientation we want. So it's a really great um, picking sorting solution and fits in a very small space. We've been seeing uptake from customers where we're retrofitting machines we built in the past with this new solution. And uh, if you're running two shifts, it usually has a one year payback period. Wow, one year is very fast. Yeah, it's, it makes it a no brainer especially when you're having trouble recruiting people in general. So the one-year payback is almost like secondary to the fact that you couldn't get enough people to run your factory at all. Ben, thank you very much for taking the time and the chat. I Thanks, appreciate Jim. it. I'd like to uh, change the pace a little bit and introduce autonomous robot restaurant serving made to order meals in a box. And in this case, it's a big box, but no bigger than three soft drink vending machines strapped together. These restaurants in a box powered by robots Entrepreneurs and service providers will certainly change the way that food is delivered in airports, trade shows, retail, hotels, malls, and the like. Rollwalk is from SJW Robotics. Is their, it's their first product, and it's aimed at hungry travelers, like in this photo. Uh, this person's likely ordering a Thai dish with vegetables and noodles. A Rollwalk needs consistency, but also delivery and packaging that accommodates their machine. A huge MRO opportunity. So change packaging and portioning to help customers like this to easily fill and refill their canisters for delivery of up to 300 meals per day. And we'll next introduce a similar product from a company called Gastronomist. So if you can roll that uh, slide, please, Tara. Next up, we have Christian Tesbazian from Gastronomist joining us in studio today to talk more about AI chefs or robot cooks, whatever you call them. He's the one that can give us more insight into what is happening now and what we can expect in the future. Christian, welcome to our show. Thank you very much, Jim. Happy to be here. You're COO and uh, co-founder of Gastronomist. Yes, sir. Very and, proud to be. And you brought some video today. Yes. Why don't we take a look at it, Jim? Um, so what you see here is, is the first thing that that team Gastron Gastronomist put together. We got to put together something. In one month, we had no real engineers. We had no really big resources. At that time, I was still a, a student, computer science student at the University of Waterloo. So we said, okay, we got to put together something by the end of this summer, which demonstrates number one, our capabilities. I mean, the technology that went into that is, is not an easy task. You got fully automated dispensers, washing machines, you got robots working together in a, in a, in a shared kitchen environment. So that was one aspect, you know, to demonstrate what we as a team are capable of. But second and most importantly, it was to begin initiating discussions. 
far too many times startups, not only in the in 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 this space, but in any space, make the mistake of spending years building the first thing without any without getting any sort of feedback. Mm -hmm. We could not have that. So we said we got to put together something quickly to be able to bring in customers, bring in suppliers. And Jim, we must have run five, six hundred shows. I mean, I ate so much pasta. It was it was out <laughs> of this world. Um, so, yeah, it, it was a great piece of, of technology to begin initiating discussions and really learning about the market. Um, a lot of people ask, can I have that in my kitchen? Look, it is definitely something we could do, but there are much more pressing needs right now for our customers and for this market in general. That's the end goal, but there's many more steps in between to get there. So, Kristen, what's the market for automated robot chefs? What isn't the market for automated robot chefs? I mean, food. F food is the oldest thing. I, since, since there was the first human, there was food. We have, we have to have food, you know, three meals a day. It is the last gym great frontier of automation. We look at any industry today, and that industry has undergone significant technological transformation, significant innovation over the past 20 or 30 years. But food, the way that... And, and I'll, I'll clarify one thing, commercial, I'm talking about kind of fast food mm -hmm. brands, QSR brands, commissaries, not fine dining. Those chefs, uh, those, the people in those kitchens are, are artisans. You, yes. you cannot take that away from them. Um, but the way that fast food, QSR food is, is prepared, it is much like a mini factory. You got to do the same steps in the most timely, efficient, and, and you know, reliable manner as possible. But so many things have changed, you know, the market has changed, their inputs have changed, everything has changed, but the equipment that they're using, the way that they're cooking the food hasn't. Back of house, front of house, uh, commissaries, high throughput, low throughput, uh, it is all, all, all applicable for robotics and, and automation. And can you tell us who your bullseye, like who those, those perfect customers are for you? Our bullseye customers are customers who want to innovate and be at the forefront of a new market. Our customers are the ones who say, we are not happy right now with how things are. We are not happy with the solutions available on the market. We want to be the ones to lead this great frontier of automation and smart technology. So, and you're taking a very uh, innovative approach to creating modular automation. Can yes. you tell me a little bit about what that is? Rome was not built in a day and, and fully automated kitchens are not gonna appear in a day either. You cannot go to these huge clients or, or any client at all and say, look, I need you to now build a brand new restaurant built around technology, which is brand new into the market. It, it, it won't work. You got to go step by step. So we are pursuing a modular approach. So we're releasing and, and we'll be releasing very soon to the market uh, products, which focus on a very specific task in the restaurant mm -hmm. can very easily be implemented into existing restaurants. Uh, very easy to clean, maintain, use. And from there, you know, restaurants and customers can gain confidence in this sort of new technology as well. Consumers can gain confidence in this sort of new technology. Uh, you know, they can pilot that, begin rolling it out and then put in the second machine, the third machine, the fourth machine, so on. And on the back end of things, these are all going to connect together. And you've had a lot of uh, interest from around the world. And what gets you most excited about the technology? Working with a great team and working with great customers to develop technology, which is really going to lead this world by storm and, and Canadian technology. We're very, very proud of that. I'm very excited for you. I think it's a great product Thank and uh, cannot wait to uh, finally order something from a robot chef. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, we cannot wait to, to serve something from a robot chef. So gastronomists, Robo Eats, RoWalk from uh, SJW Robotics, the kitchen's the place to be when it comes to robots and cooking and partnerships. So robots uh, is an exciting place to be right now, and it seems all the moons have alive, aligned. Robots are relatively inexpensive. IoT and Industry 4.0 have paved the way to make sensors work for us. And then when these machines go to scale, they'll be sharing recipes, they'll be optimizing materials and flavoring food for specific tastes. It's also getting competitive and that competition for the industry is good. And no longer will a hotel ever have to shut down for the night. You can just click on your phone and you'll be enjoying a pasta primavera at 3 a.m. in your hotel room, probably cooked by a robot and probably delivered by a robot. And in closing up the presentation, I'd like to show you an autonomous food delivery robot that was kind enough to bring their robot to their recording studio. 
So uh, Tara, let's roll the next video. At CFIN, we're all about fun surprises, and we have a surprise celebrity guest for you today to help wrap up our program. Please help me welcome a robot famous on the downtown streets of Toronto. Please welcome Jeffrey, the last mile delivery robot. Jeffrey, do you have something for me? Nice, you bring me a drink at the end of the show. Well, I'm keen to learn more about you, so why don't we talk to our friend at Tiny Mile? Hello, we're back in studio, and I've got Sharif Farani from me, who is the head of growth at Tiny Mile Robotics. And you're a Toronto-based manufacturer, correct? That's correct, yeah. Our tiny factory is located right here in the heart of Toronto, and uh, they're made by Canadians for Canadians. That's very cool. And can you tell us a little bit about Jeffrey, your robot? Yeah, for sure. Jeffrey is your modern-day postman in pink. Uh, he's truly neighborhood local delivery, and he's low impact, low emissions, low cost. And it, the whole goal of it is to make delivery more accessible to people in your local delivery uh, kind of neighborhood and promote a diverse business ecosystem. And so what kind of things are you delivering? We're delivering anything from food to small retail and uh, groceries. And the interesting thing about Jeffrey is our way that we approach robotic design. So, you know, the normal kind of robots that you see uh, in the U.S. are operating around other parts of the world are autonomous robots. Well, we've decided to approach it in a human-centric form of robot design. And so what that means is our robots are really meant to work in cooperation with humans. And so they're actually tele-operated, tele remotely operated by pilots. And it makes them a little bit more safer and adds that extra light level of trust to them as well. We're one of the only uh, robot designs out there that have a 360 uh, camera, so it gives quite a, a quite a viewpoint uh, when you're looking from the driver point of view. And your clients are, say, downtown restaurants in, in Toronto? Our clients are downtown restaurants or suburbs as well. We're operating right now uh, in the U.S. in Charlotte. Charlotte's one of the most technologically innovative cities in America, and so we found it as a great testing ground for, uh, for Jeffrey. And so what are some of the technological uh, challenges that you've had to address? Weather is definitely something that's always been a challenge, but fortunately for us, Jeffrey can go in about four inches of snow. And also the street conditions are something that we're testing to see as well. What are the limitations in that capacity? So the future is kind of fun for you. The future is definitely fun and the future is pink right now, for sure. That's wonderful. <laughs> I, I love that segment at Tiny Mile. I love their approach. They're low emissions, low impact, battery driven, and, and the robots themselves are driven by people. All that and powered by Canadian tech. And as I close up my uh, part of the presentation today, I'd like you to I'd like to join. I would like you to invite. I would like you to invite you to join CFIN. I don't know why I can't say that. So if you're involved in the food industry in Canada and you see yourself or your company in the above slide, or you know someone who might be a good fit, please consider joining CFIN. It's free and it only takes a few minutes to join. The memberships are open to all individuals working in food who have an interest in innovation. So just Google CFIN Canada in your browser and you'll find the website. And thanks, Mario, and to your staff at Annex and MRO Magazine for allowing me to take part in the uh, conversation today. All right. Thank you very much, Jim. Lots of great information, and I uh, loved all the videos. Um, actually, I've been to a ghost kitchen in my town. Uh, Have you? What I, like, what I like the most, well, it was within a Walmart, um, which a lot of them are within current stores. Uh, what I like most about it is that it had brands that I could order that don't have, an, you know, like a storefront anywhere you know, a lot of American brands that we don't really have up here. Um, so that's the thing I like the most about it. Yeah, you can order Cinnabon or something that you'd yeah. never, ever get to unless an American airport or something like that. All right. Uh, so let's just look at some uh, questions that have come in. Um, if anyone has any questions while we're still in our Q&A, uh, please post them. Uh, our first question. You get to talk to a lot of companies and machine builders about Industry 4.0. How are we doing in Canada with integrating technologies for Industry 4.0? You know, Mario, I, I'm a big fan of 4.0 uh, 4 and big fan of data, um, but I think it's kind of a complex answer. I, I feel there's a lot of companies on the fence, and I talk to a lot of machine builders in my in my consultancy. Uh, if ma manufacturers want a machine, they want the data, but sometimes they're not sure what to do with it, and they're wondering sometimes. I think as well, can they monetize the data? Uh, maybe they don't have a strategy um, or a target or they don't have staff or they don't have budget. Um, so I, th I think it takes the leadership to understand the value of data and committing to be a digitally data run company. 
And I feel too that there's a lot of companies that feel they're too small. Uh, the part that I do feel good about is that customers, I think, will start uh, in, including this into their specs, into their machine builds. And smart marketers will use data as a competitive advantage and communicating it to their customers as a, uh, a differentiator. It can just be a checkbox, right, in your uh, RFQ or RFI. So if you're making parts for us, you're also giving us the data sets and maybe manufacturers have to get more creative and put a price on this uh, data, sell it separately. All right, sounds good. Next question, uh, for a company just getting started with automation and robotics, what is the ideal first step to take? You know, I think um, get, get your uh, suppliers involved early. So, you know, a lot of times uh, people are so afraid of that negotiating time that they forget to come to a couple of key suppliers and maybe they fund a project to reduce risk. So uh, some you call it breadboarding or maybe it's a, um, an engineering study so that if you start a little bit early and even things like um, getting the legals done, the legals today take like months and months. So if you want, if you want a machine delivered in a year, you've kind of got to work that back and maybe start uh, 14 and 15 and 16 months early and, and reduce your risk involve the people that you want to involve early. And some of these robot manufacturers like ABB or Fanuc or whoever, they will actually do uh, um, proof of concepts for you at very little or very low charge just to get you to uh, understand all these risks that you want to abate so that you can take as much risk off the table means that you will have a reduced price, but you also have a faster delivery of a machine. Okay. Um, as manufacturers, how much of our machine budget should we allocate to Industry 4.0 and things like AI? So, you know, the big question is, right, do you need Industry 4.0 and do you need AI? And I think in so many cases, every motor, every robot, everything is coming with built-in Industry 4.0. So it's almost more, it almost costs you more not to take it. But uh, so if I tell you any number, it's going to be wrong. But look at spare parts. Let's say it's compared to, say, spare parts for a machine that you're uh, uh, that you're ordering. And that seems like a good number. So you order a million dollar piece of capital equipment. Uh, if you spend like seven to 9% of your CapEx on spares, it would likely be the same making the equipment really smart. And the good news is that you might not have to use all that uh, CapEx on spare or the CapEx adder on spare parts because now your industry 4.0, your your robot will tell you when it's shuttering or when it's, uh, or your servo motors will tell you when they're, when they're coughing up. So you might not need so much uh, spare parts on your inventory. All right, and we got time for one more question. Uh, who pays for things like industry 4.0, intelligent machines, machine learning, and AI? Again, that's a, that's a good question. It's a tough question because uh, at the end of the day, the customer should really pay for this, right? We should be able to figure out a way that we can take this data and monetize it and say, hey, um, we're now a much better manufacturer. But And of course, your end user is going to push back and say, no, actually, you're the better manufacturer. You should be absorbing uh, these costs. So uh, I think that the the, the answer is it's, a, it's going to be a bit of a mix. Uh, if, for some companies, this will be a huge competitive advantage. They'll be able to sell more and they should be able to charge more because they're providing uh, uh, better data. So, you know, here's, here's the widget. It's, it's $1, but if you want it with the data, it's $1. five or $1. two, And that may be the way that you market to your end customer where they are sharing in that pain. Maybe not all of it, but some of it. All right. Thank you once again, Jim, for your very informative session. Thank you. And I'll look forward to Jim's next session too from ADD.